Good morning or afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar describing a National Roadmap for Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, or GEBS, as you'll hear used a lot today. Uh, I want to let you know this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted for your future reference along with today's slide deck. I'm Andy Satchwell. I'm a research scientist at Berkeley Lab and one of the GEB Roadmap co-authors. Um, I just want to mention a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendee audio and video are disabled, and we ask uh, that you submit questions or share comments via the Q&A box that's available at the bottom of the screen. We plan to have ample time for discussion and encourage you to submit uh, to the Q&A box during the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to welcome today's presenters. Um, we're joined by David Nemzo, director of the DOE's Building Technologies Office. Also, Marianne Piet, director of the Building Technology and Urban Systems Division at Berkeley Lab, and Ryan Ludick, a principal at the Brattle Group. I also want to especially thank David and Monica Newcomb, also with the DOE Building Technologies Office, for their thought leadership in advancing efficient buildings as a grid resource to drive the clean energy economy. They're responsible for the vision behind this GEB roadmap, for sure. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the important contributions of uh, many co-authors, including Dan Delury, Kitty Wing, Daniela Urigwe, and Aditya Kandakar. So I'm now going to uh, hand the mic over to David Nemzo to share uh, his welcome and opening room remarks. David? Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds great. Good, thanks. And welcome, everybody. And as Andy said, we've had a, uh, an incredible turnout uh, for this uh, webinar. I like to call them webinars, and uh, on this important topic. And uh, I, I know just from looking at the list, we have people that not only from all over the country, but from well beyond. And at least last I looked, at least three different continents covered, uh, four, sorry, uh, uh, four that I know of. And look, I, I don't think that's any surprise because this issue has become so important and is, is so central to the future of energy efficiency, to the future of buildings, and to the future of uh, decarbonization and climate mitigation, this, glow, this, this increasing uh, climate crisis. And so we're very pleased that the uh, uh, DOE Berkeley Brattle uh, and larger team was able to develop this first ever national uh, roadmap. Um, you might have uh, seen last week, the roadmap was released last Monday, the 17th by Energy Secretary Granholm. And again, uh, recognition of the, uh, uh, of the importance of the issue, especially as we embark on the goal in the US of decarbonizing our entire power grid, which means, which means a lot of things, which means we need to use every electron efficiently. We need to use it flexibly at the right time of day and we need to integrate uh, renewables, especially the quickly growing uh, variable renewables. And uh, buildings consume three quarters of the uh, country's electrons. We hope that number will go down as we become more efficient and as transportation becomes more electrified, but uh, that share will go down, I should say, but it will still be an enormous number. And that's why we're here, of course. This report, I'll say briefly, was uh, this roadmap rather, was kicked off uh, over a year ago and led by the team that I mentioned, and that at uh, an advisory, a technically advisory group that included many of you, including EPRI, CEE, the Alliance Safe Energy, uh, NASIO, uh, NARUC, um, um, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and many others, and uh, representing industry and professionals. We also, the team interviewed over 100 experts to come down and receive 800 comments. So we'll see what you think. The report has both groundbreaking analysis as well as 14 key recommendations. And we'd like to know what you think about uh, uh, that. We have a goal that's laid out for the first time in this report, a DOE goal to triple energy efficiency and triple demand flexibility of buildings by 2030. That's a scant uh, nine years away. And we describe that path through that recommendations. We think that if, uh, if you all, if we all, my department and my office uh, take, uh, do everything we need to, we can hit that goal of tripping, but it won't come to us easy, but it is essential. And uh, we will continue to do that at the Department of Energy. We have a series of activities and uh, my colleague who I also wanna give a shout out to Monica Newcomb as well as the rest of us at the Building Technologies Office in the Department of Energy are gonna to work to play that role in advancing 
grid interactive efficient buildings to better to make buildings more efficient, more affordable, the grid more reliable, uh, uh, buildings more resilient to reach out to all communities, not just affluent ones uh, with these technologies. And again, to integrate uh, variable, excuse me, variable and renewables, especially the distributed ones. And we have a series of activities we don't have time for today. I hope you'll go to our website as well as at Berkeley's and, and see those activities. And I want you to know that uh, we're gonna continue to work with Monica and myself and the whole team at DOE to uh, do stakeholder outreach. So please don't be strangers. If you learn nothing else from this webinar, I hope you learn that you can reach any of us at DOE. Just our email address is always firstname.lastname at hq.doe.gov or occasionally ee.doe.gov also works. So reach out to us. We're gonna reach out to you uh, via those groups I mentioned before, uh, as well as Better Buildings members, ACEEEs, uh, uh, panel. Uh, uh, I'll be speaking later today on these topics at the uh, uh, NIA's uh, annual uh, uh, efficiency exchange, et cetera. So uh, that's a long way of saying uh, we ain't going anywhere. This issue is going to grow. As you will see, it's going to uh, triple before the end of the decade. We're going to make buildings more grid interactive. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, have the pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Marianne Piet. You already know her title, so I'm going to say this because she's been a leader for so many years uh, in the field of uh, demand response and demand flexibility in building science. If you don't know who Marianne Piet is, you are on the wrong webinar today. Marianne. Thanks so much, David. I want to start by thanking David and Monica Newcomb for their leadership at the Building Technologies Office at DOE. It's been really an exciting uh, year plus in putting this roadmap together. And DOE's had the vision for this activity. I want to make it I really- I said, Marianne, I forgot to say, it's buckle up time at DOE. Buckle up time. And uh, what's really fascinating is we've been working on energy efficiency for four decades plus, and we still care a lot about energy efficiency. So that's the foundation of our work. Um, but it's not just about how much energy you use, but when you use it. And that's really a big change. And that change is really important if we wanna have more renewables on the electric grid because we have variable supply, we need flexible demand. And there's a lot of research that we need to do to make sure that we're providing value to utility customers, to people that pay bills. We wanna lower electricity bills and we wanna thank everybody for joining today's webinar because we need all of you to work with us to achieve the goals that David just described. Uh, it's very important that we move towards both a clean, affordable, and reliable grid, as David mentioned, as well as equitable. So I'll, I'll keep my remarks quite short. We're really excited to be thinking about the automation and the technology, as well as the utility programs and the value proposition to move into the next generation of grid interactive efficient, affordable buildings. And I want to let you know, gebroadmap.lbl.gov is where you can download the report. Uh, and that was the first question we saw in the, in the Q&A this morning. So gebroadmap.lbl.gov. And I'll hand it over to Ryan. Thanks, everybody. Great. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, it's, it's always hard to follow Marianne for many reasons, in, including the really cool background that she has for these Zoom calls with the guitar on the, the guitars on the wall. My, my bike wheel clock always feels so in, insufficient in, in comparison. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, we will just move now straight into discussing some of the highlights of the roadmap. Um, and we will start with, with why we're here. Why, why are we talking about GEBS? Um, well, the reason is GEBS can do a lot of things that are really important uh, to facilitating the transition that the, that the energy industry is, is currently going through. Um, GEBS can play a key role in integrating uh, growing amounts of renewable energy. Um, GEBS can help to uh, reduce or, or defer the cost of investments in aging electricity system infrastructure and improve reliability as a, as a result. Um, GEBS can help uh, you know, in particular to assist in achieving decarbonization goals, both through improvements in energy efficiency and the reduction in the use of fossil fuel, um, and also through, uh, through electrification and, and, uh, um, and switching over to, to cleaner sources of energy. I mean, and then finally, and this is the part that I think often gets overlooked, um, GEBS also 
help to uh, basically improve the consumer experience by optimizing energy use in a way that, that better aligns with, with customer preferences. So these are four kind of key areas where, where GEB can, can really help the industry get to where it wants to go. Um, but then the next question is how, 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 do, how do buildings do that? Um, and there are really four features that define a grid interactive efficient building. The first, I think the one that, that DOE and, and LBNL always lead with is efficiency. Grid interactive efficient buildings are efficient um, and, and can provide deep reductions in overall energy use. Second is that the buildings are connected. You know, we're, we're no longer talking about one-way communication flows or, or you know, very sort of you know, disconnected, isolated systems. GEBs have two-way communication that allow technologies to talk to each other, um, to talk to the grid, and to communicate with occupants of the building. The third feature is that GEBs are smart um, and include a level of intelligence and sensors and, and controls that can optimize the efficiency um, and the, the consumption of energy in buildings in a way that, that typically hasn't been achieved in the past. And then lastly, and, and importantly, tying back to a comment that, that Mary Ann had made, is GEBs are flexible, right? Um, David mentioned demand flexibility in, in, in his opening comments. So this is not just about reducing energy use in buildings, that's part of it, but it's also about making sure that energy is being consumed during times of day, seasons, um, week, days of the week that, that are the most important and efficient um, to provide all those services that we just discussed on the previous slide. Um, so at a basic level, we're talking about energy efficiency and demand flexibility for residential and commercial buildings, but it's, it's much more than that. It's a very advanced form of the types of energy efficiency and, and demand response that, that we're used to talking about. So that hopefully helps to start to answer the question of what is a GEB. Um, and now we'll take just a minute to talk about the roadmap. Um, the roadmap has four key objectives and it's, it's organized sort of, I think, consistent, consistently with a lot of the um, roadmap uh, approaches that you've, you've probably seen in other contexts. We start by estimating the value of the untapped opportunity for GEBs to provide value to the power system. So all those benefits that we were just describing we put some numbers behind that. Next, uh, we define the GEB vision. What tech, from a technological standpoint, what, what will GEBs look like in the future? Um, once we've laid out that opportunity and the vision, then we dig into some of the barriers around GEB deployment and really try and understand and prioritize what are those, those key barriers that are keeping us from fully realizing that opportunity. And in particular, what we've tried to do with this roadmap is not just to develop a laundry list of 300 barriers, but through a lot of that stakeholder outreach that David was describing, we have tried to prioritize that and focus on those key barriers that, that are preventing progress. And then as the fourth step, and really the key step in all of this, um, we've laid out recommendations for overcoming the barriers, and those are recommendations that extend to, to all major um, industry stakeholder groups. Um, so as, as I think David mentioned, you know, th this involves input from over 100 practitioners and researchers and, and other experts in the field, um, presumably including many, many people who are on this webinar today. So we're very thankful for all of that input. Um, just a quick comment on the scope and boundaries of the roadmap. As I mentioned, we're focused on residential and commercial building loads over the next 10 years. We didn't want this to be a 30-year outlook. We wanted it to be a 10-year outlook so that the actions and, and recommendations that are being presented here are something that are tangible and that we can start working on immediately. The roadmap focuses on all distributed energy resources, but with a particular focus on efficiency and the active management of building electricity consumption. And it includes recommendations for all electricity industry stakeholders, but it's not intended to be prescriptive. This is intended to lay out options and opportunities that, that the industry broadly can pursue to realize the benefits that are laid out in this roadmap. So now we'll get into the, the quantification of that GEB opportunity, which um, as a bit of a spoiler alert, you can see on this slide, we've estimated to be between 100 and $200 billion 
of power system cost savings over the next 20 years. So just a, a quick note, you know, the, the analysis that's behind that 100, 100 to 200 billion dollar estimate um, involves um, really exciting amount of collaboration between Brattle and NREL and DOE and LBNL in terms of leveraging various modeling capabilities that all of those organizations have been developing and, and investing in over a course the course of a number of years. Um, so you know the process starts with defining GEB measures. I think we looked at over 40 different uh, GEB measures that um, that reflect kind of best avail commercially available technologies that exist today. We define that list, then we simulated the, the performance of those technologies in thousands of different buildings on an 8,760 hour of the year basis. So we took an hourly look at how these technologies can impact building operations and energy consumption. Then we've take, we took those building level results and scaled them by region up to, to reflect the characteristics of 22 different regions in the United States. Um, we took those impacts, which are now at the regional level, and adjusted them so that they would reflect achievable and realistic rates of adoption of the technologies and accounted for stock turnover and other considerations like that. So the point here is this is not a technical potential study where we've said, what would happen if literally every building in the country became a GEB? We've said, if, if you got to voluntary sort of opt-in adoption rates that are consistent with levels of participation observed in energy efficiency and demand response um, programs historically, what would the benefits look like? So this, this is considered to be uh, an aggressive but achievable level of adoption. Then we developed a, a, a 10-year forecast of system costs. Um, on the power system, and then looked um, kind of as the last step at on an again on an hourly basis how these different GEB measures would would could reduce those system costs, and that involves some um, dynamic modeling of particularly of the demand flexibility measures and making sure that they were being dispatched and utilized in a way that would that would maximize system benefits. Um, so you can see that we're tying tying together a lot of different modeling frameworks here to 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 back up this analysis. So this slide is, is kind of the, at the national level, the, the summary of the, the benefits and impacts that were estimated through this study. We looked at a number of different scenarios. Um, you know, I mentioned that we modeled achievable rates of technology adoption. We did some sensitivity cases around that. So we had low, mid, and high adoption cases. Um, we also looked at how different future levels of renewable energy adoption uh, on the power system could affect the value proposition. And then also did some sensitivity around the need for new capacity in the future and what that would be worth um, and kind of what the value of using GEB technologies could be in avoiding the need to develop new um, peaking resources on the power system. So the results are definitely sensitive to those assumptions. You know, I, I think adoption in particular, what we assume about levels of adoption is a key driver of the differences. Um, but what we get to is about, you know, uh, between really, I would say 13 billion and 18 billion is kind of the, the reasonable range of, of impacts that we estimated as annual benefits uh, to the power grid by 2030. And then again, if, if we look at, you know, assume a level of a trajectory toward adoption and, and, and um, look at a present value of those benefits over a 20 year period, that amounts to 100 to $200 billion in, in cost savings. On the peak demand uh, and energy savings side, you know, we're talking about big impacts here as well. In the mid case, we're looking at about 78 gigawatts of reduction in peak demand uh, and about 284 terawatt hours of energy savings resulting from these measures. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll put those impacts into context so that they're a little bit easier to relate to. So, so on this slide, we'll start with the chart on the left. This is showing those impacts that I just described. Um, the left chart shows the dispatchable peak demand reduction capability associated with the GEB measures that we modeled. So the bar on the left is showing the existing demand response capability that we have today. And when I say existing demand response capability, I'm talking about automated demand response in residential and commercial buildings. 
where you're directly controlling um, end use load in those buildings. We have about 10 gigawatts of that capability that already exists today through utility programs in particular. Um, the potential that we've estimated in this study in the mid case scenario um, would, would more than double that and would increase the capability to about 26 gigawatts. If we look at higher, still achievable, but higher levels of adoption, um, that existing capability would, would essentially quadruple to 43.5 gigawatts. So we're talking about a lot of untapped potential that, that we're seeing in GEBS from a demand flexibility and peak reduction capability standpoint. On the energy saving side, the picture is similar. The, the first bar um, of the right-hand chart shows the existing amount of uh, energy, energy savings cap uh, impacts or capability that have been achieved through utility deployed energy efficiency programs between 2010 and 2019. So essentially a, you know, the, the 10 year period spanning the, the prior decade. Um, those programs over that 10 year period got to annual savings of 221 terawatt hours. Um, what we've identified as potential in the GEB study, again, is more than doubling that potential uh, under a mid adoption case and you know, effectively tripling that under the high adoption case. So you can see how these impacts are tying back to that, that DOE uh, goal for, for energy efficiency and demand flexibility that David had mentioned in his comments. So that's the story around the, the cost savings and the system impacts in terms of megawatts and, and megawatt hours. But there's also an important piece here which relates to emissions and carbon emissions and the role of GEBS in, in facilitating the, the decarbonization of the power sector and the economy more broadly. Our modeling also looked at this and what we found is um, by 2030, GEBS could be re reducing carbon emissions by 80 million tons per year. That's 6% of all power sector carbon emissions. Um, and just to put it into context, it's the equivalent of, of uh, more than 50 medium-sized coal plants or, or 17 million cars being taken off the road. Um, now, what's interesting about this is the, the, the CO2 savings opportunity really varies by region. And that's what's shown in the chart on the right. So you can see that in some regions, um, particularly those where there's, there's more coal generation, um, you know, fossil-based generation, particularly where you have those units on the margin during a lot of hours of the year, um, the opportunity for, for GEBS to reduce emissions are higher than in other regions of the country where there's already been a more meaningful transition toward you know, cleaner, you know, renewal based, renewables-based sources of, of electricity. Um, so that chart is just showing you know, per megawatt hour saved uh, the CO2 reduction benefit in each of the kind of major categories of regions that we had modeled in the study. So, and, and so just to follow up on that, a comment that we'll make here is, um, you know, these are big numbers. Um, we actually, for a variety of reasons listed on this slide, feel like these are actually pretty conservative estimates. And, and these are just a few reasons. What we have on this slide is just a few examples of um, additional sources of value that aren't captured in this study. Um, so we looked at, you know, the potential to, to def defer or avoid the need for transmission capacity. We didn't take that down to the distribution level, given that avoided distribution costs are such a utility system specific um, issue to try and estimate. Um, so pulling in those distribution benefits could increase um, the financial value considerably. Um, same goes for you know, accounting for avoided RPS related um, uh, additions of renewable energy. The same also applies to option value. You know, we've, we've looked at the value of GEBS under normal weather and load conditions. Um, but if you start to think about the role that energy efficiency and, and demand response can play under more extreme weather conditions, as we've seen in Texas and, and parts of the West recently, um, you know, you, as you could imagine, the, the value proposition there could be significantly higher. Um, there are other consumer benefits that, that aren't captured in an analysis of power system costs, um, such as improved you know, satisfaction or comfort among building owners and occupants. And lastly, and importantly, you know, our study um, didn't look at aggressive scenarios around electrification. 
Increasing demand through electrification not only creates a greater need for energy efficiency and demand flexibility to manage the costs associated with all that load growth, it also means that you're going to be bringing new sources of load onto the system that potentially could be very significant sources of flexibility, electric vehicle charging being one of those. Um, so as we think about next steps in the research and kind of where I think DOE probably will in, intend to go from here in terms of future research, focusing on the integration of DERs more broadly into buildings and looking at the additional flexibility and efficiency and carbon benefits associated with that, I think is, is kind of the key next step in terms of the quantitative analysis. Um, and with that, uh, on that topic of, of building integration and, and technologies, Andy, why don't I hand it back over to you to talk about the GEV vision? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the what of this roadmap in terms of the key technologies that are needed and how they could be integrated to realize the economic and emissions opportunities that Ryan just presented. So a key element of this vision is to take full advantage of diverse building loads by enabling a building to have multiple end uses that can provide grid services. While energy efficiency and demand flexibility can be realized through individual end use technologies, a fully optimized GEB uses advanced controls for active and continuous energy management of efficiency and demand flexibility across the building systems. And it's not just the power system uh, benefits that Ryan described, uh, you know, through increased controllability of end uses and flexible electricity consumption, customers can also benefit from lower electricity bills, improved reliability, and greater comfort and productivity. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the GEB vision is reflected in the simultaneous use of load flexibility and energy efficiency. So, you know, many current advances in smart energy management may drive significant energy savings, but may have minimal impact on demand flexibility. Similarly, although automated demand response programs promote demand flexibility, they provide, in some cases, minimal improvement in energy efficiency. So evolution in program design may support both energy efficiency as well as load management or demand response goals. So for example, a more efficient and grid interactive heat pump water heater demonstrates the capability of this end use load to be met with energy efficient technology that also provides grid services. Another example is improving insulation, reducing infiltration and retrofitting single paned windows with high performance double or triple glazed windows reduces the size of the HVAC system that's needed for heating and cooling, as well as reducing the building's peak demand. And importantly, these improvements to tighten the building envelope will improve the use of HVAC as a flexible load because thermal energy to heat and cool the building can be stored in the building mass. So further advances in program design may combine loads across numerous buildings, as well as integrate PV, EVs, and storage. Let's go to the next slide. So the GEB vision that's articulated in the roadmap describes the features of a whole building integrated approach. And this can be used to identify the innovations that are needed to move beyond just individual technologies. So our GEB vision states that a GEB is capable of providing energy efficient building services and dynamic grid services through connected smart control of multiple flexible building loads and DERs. So this includes attributes like two-way communication between technologies, the grid and occupants to respond to grid needs. Uh, also the co-optimization of multiple end uses uh, and to meet multiple objectives. So improving occupant comfort and minimizing overall energy use and also providing services to support the electric grid directly. A key to the GEP vision is technology integration. And in the roadmap, we identify two important types. So first is the integration between layers which is important to maximize the performance of each end use and avoid conflicts between competing objectives. The second type is the integration across multiple end uses at the supervisory control layer. This is to take advantage of synergies between end use systems that include DERs and achieve further optimization of the building operations. And interoperability, which is the ability of devices or software systems to reliably exchange information is necessary for enabling plug and play operation of GEB technologies and for the flow of information across these integrated layers. And it's also important to mention that cybersecurity is critical and must be implemented at GEBs. 
Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. While there's a number of commercially available GEB technologies with high demand flexibility potential, this would include smart thermostats, water heaters with smart connected controls, and automated window shading attachments. There's also several key GEB technologies with more limited availability or deployed in pilots and or under development. We've identified some of these key technologies through some existing technical reports that BTO has, has published and as well as some expert input that we uh, solicited through the course of developing the roadmap. And we've identified some of them in this figure. So at the physical layer at the bottom of this figure, certain end use equipment and envelope system technologies have high demand flexibility potential when paired with control technologies, as well as high efficiency improvement potential through electrification. So for example, heat pumps, HVAC and hot water combination systems and heat pump water heaters. Thermal energy storage, or TES, is assigned its own category as a subset of physical systems because of its unique demand flexibility potential. Technologies at the local control level are represented by specific physical systems with controls. So for example, connected lighting and appliances, as well as controls technologies that work with building systems to enable grid interactive behavior. All of the local controls and supervisory control technologies at the top of the graphic are DF enabled. So this denotes the addition of demand flexibility capabilities to automatically respond to grid signals and provide grid services. The supervisory control layer illustrates technologies that can coordinate grid responsive behavior across multiple end uses. So like a building automation system or a smart home energy management system. They could also uh, coordinate response across multiple buildings or improve the capabilities of existing supervisory control systems like predictive control. Let's go to the next slide. So the discussion so far has largely focused on opportunities for improving the efficiency and flexibility of building loads and building equipment. But looking to emerging trends, the integration of DERs with building loads will become a critical element of the GEP vision. So the additional benefits of coordinated deployment of building integrated DERs will improve the value proposition beyond what Ryan described. So new building loads like electric vehicle charging, are projected to become a significant source of demand and demand flexibility that could be coordinated with building loads to provide additional grid interactivity. Energy storage systems also provide a variety of valuable GEB use cases. So this would include for resilience, like as a backup, uh, a, a form of on-site backup generation for the customer, for firming PV generation when paired as a hybrid resource, and for providing capacity and ancillary services value to the utility system. PV has grown rapidly as a means to reduce building demand and provide clean energy back to the grid. And building integrated PV can be coordinated to reduce thermal envelope and lighting loads. And also GEBS can support the utilization of PV in cases where managed consumption of building loads can actually serve as a storage resource. On this slide, we identify, and also in the report, we identify some cross-cutting research ideas to explore greater integration of DERs with buildings. So they include improved tools to both quantify the opportunity and communicate that value of integrating DERs to, to building owners, designers, construction firms, and customers. Also additional data to support load forecasting and operations and workforce education and training. So with that, I'll pass the mic back to Ryan uh, to talk uh, about some of the barriers and more importantly, how we can realize the substantial opportunities and achieve, achieve the GEP vision. So Ryan. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so as An Andy said, we're now at the point where we get to talk about how we're gonna make all of this happen, or at least some recommendations for doing so. Um, we'll start with just one slide on the barriers and then really what we wanna focus on here for the last bit of this presentation is, is the recommendations for, for overcoming these barriers. So on this slide, um, you know what we've done in the what we've done in the roadmap is we've organized our survey of the barriers to GEB deployment and adoption um, according to what what we have what we have described as the GEB value chain. So the GEB value chain starts with developing these technologies, and that's where software and hardware developers and researchers are playing a key role. And some of the some examples of the barriers that are Preventing progress in that area include, um, you know, for example, standardization and interoperability, or you know, kind of a, a lack of sufficient algorithms for controlling flexible loads. So that's kind of that's the technology piece. How do we get this started through technology? 
Then we move on to deployment. Um, there needs to be sufficient deployment of these technologies that actually gets them into buildings so that they can be used in a way that benefits consumers in the power grid. Um, so deployment, you know, really that's a, that's a big role for installers, aggregators and ESCOs, and of course utilities. And here, you know, examples of barriers could include, you know, market rules that, that limit aggregators' abilities to, to deploy technologies, um, or it could include energy efficiency and, and demand flexibility being underrepresented in, in utility planning, which, which limits opportunities for, for these various entities to come in and, and deploy technologies as part of a utility program. And then there are also issues along the lines of, of what Andy was just describing around awareness or training among installers. Um, so that's the deployment piece of the value chain. And then we move to you know, what I view as being maybe the most critical piece of all of this, which is consumer adoption. How do we get consumers, building owners, managers interested in and excited about adopting these, these technologies and, and participating in GEB programs? Um, so here, you know, it's uh, some of the, the barriers that are preventing progress in this area center around the value proposition to consumers or awareness of the value proposition um, or issues related to the technology being perceived as too complex or, or expensive. Um, and then of course, there, there are often concerns around privacy and cybersecurity as well. Once the technology is adopted, then kind of the last step here is actually utilizing that technology in a way that does benefit the power system and benefits consumers. And here it's, you know, it's really the utilities and the ISOs and the RTOs and the grid operators that are the key entities. And the barriers to be overcome there involve developing trust in demand flexibility from an operational standpoint, and also particularly developing the right incentives for utilities to pursue demand side measures over other you know, traditional sources of you know, supply side investment. And there's a lot, of, a lot of work that's happening in that area today. Now, lastly, kind of the, the bottom box on this slide tees up the, the kind of supporting uh, and facilitating function that state and federal policymakers and regulators and research and advocacy groups play at all four points in that value chain. Um, and here, th those organizations face barriers as well. And I think um, one area that we want to highlight in particular is as a barrier is kind of status quo bias and, and being more comfortable with continuing to do things the way they've been done in the past, rather than thinking about and really exploring new opportunities to, to, to pursue these demand side measures that we've been discussing. You know, and there, where we've seen there being success and, and traction in that area has been when there's an internal champion at these organizations that's really pushing things forward on the demand side. So those are the barriers. Um, and we know, as you will see, anyone who, who looks at the roadmap will see, the recommendations for overcoming those barriers are organized around four pillars. Um, and this is really just an organizational technique, um, but we lay out the four pillars here. So the first pillar is advancing GEBS through research and development. The second pillar is enhancing the value of demand flexibility specifically to consumers. The third is empowering GEB users and operations. And then the fourth is, um, is you know, oriented around supporting demand flexibility deployment through state, federal, and, and local enabling programs and policies. Um, so those are the four pillars. Um, Andy and I are gonna tag team a, a slightly deeper dive into each of those on the following slides. And Andy, I'll kick it over to you to talk about pillar one. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, so we'll start here with, with pillar one. So this offers recommendations for research needed to improve technology interoperability and integration, along with some specific hardware improvements. So um, there's three recommendations in pillar one and each with several key actions. For the sake of brevity today, we've, we've captured only one key action for each recommendation, uh, just as an example, uh, but the complete list of key actions is in the roadmap. So the, the first recommendation here is, is to, to research, develop, and accelerate deployment of GEB technologies. This is in order to increase the capability, availability, cost effectiveness, and you know, even ease of use of high impact efficient building technologies. 
that can provide demand flexibility in residential and commercial buildings. One key action uh, among many for this recommendation is to support the development and field testing of user-friendly, affordable, integrated whole building control and grid service deliveries. So this might require developing lower cost and more accurate sensing options and system-wide control algorithms. The second recommendation under this pillar is to accelerate technology interoperability to optimize efficiency and demand flexibility performance. This is to ensure that end-use devices, DERs, and multiple buildings can interoperate and coordinate to provide building and grid services. Um, so one key action is to accelerate the adoption of existing open standards. Uh, existing open standards at the application layer in particular include BACnet, HTTP, OpenADR, and CTA 2045, just as examples. And the third recommendation under this pillar we've identified is to collect and provide data and develop methods for benchmarking and evaluating demand flexibility technology and whole building performance. So this is to ensure that GEB technologies, building performance and customer cost benefit data are easily accessible and to improve and standardize analytical methods. One key action here is to expand EE benchmarking data sets and tools like the Energy Star benchmarking tool uh, or the building performance database to incorporate demand flexibility. Okay, Ryan, I'll pass it over to you for, for the second pillar. Great, so pillar two is really focused on enhancing the value of GEBS to both consumers and utilities. And really what we're talking about there is creating the right incentives for utilities to want to pursue GEBS and then also creating the right incentives for consumers to go out and participate and adopt these technologies. And really when we say creating the right incentives, what we're talking about is making sure that that full value proposition of GEBS that we've been discussing um, is something that can be capitalized on and, and monetized by, by both consumers and utilities. So there are four recommendations here. The first is to improve and expand innovative customer demand flexibility program offerings. And there really what we're talking about is taking a new innovative approach to the, to the types of you know, demand response or energy efficiency programs that are offered to customers today. Um, one of the actions in this area is designing um, and marketing demand flexibility programs with a focus on consumer preferences. And you know, to me in particular, one, one thing that I think I'm really interested in and that I think is an effective approach there is coupling demand flexibility offers with other things that consumers want. So you know, one classic example is a bring your own thermostat program. Customers like smart thermostats not necessarily because they're an opportunity to participate in a demand flexibility program, but because they look good on the wall, um, they can be controlled remotely through your phone and have various other features like that. And then demand flexibility is one more feature of that smart thermostat that can be unlocked. So, so the more that we can bundle demand flexibility offers with other things that consumers are excited about, I think the more traction we'll get in this area. Second recommendation is expanding consumer knowledge and consideration of price-based programs. Here, what we're talking about are time of use rates, demand dynamic pricing programs, other retail rate designs that will provide customers with an incentive to manage their load efficiently and will provide technology firms with an incentive to go out and develop technologies that will enable that, that price response from consumers. An example action is planning for full-scale deployment and what we mean by that is, you know, we're a lot of uh, interesting work around dynamic pricing, time varying rates get stalled is after the pilot. It gets piloted, there are great pilot results, and then nothing happens. The, the box is checked and nothing happens beyond that. So the recommendation here is anytime a, a pilot is being proposed or introduced, introduce it with a, assuming the pilot will be successful and with a plan to then move beyond the pilot and deploy those new rate offerings to all customers. Third, and I think key to all of this is introducing incentives for utilities to deploy demand flexibility resources. Um, you know, as we know, utilities don't always have the full financial incentives that are necessary to consider demand flexibility equivalent to other supply side investments. So you know, identifying and evaluating incentive mechanisms that encourage investment in demand side programs is a key action here. Examples include performance-based rate making or other you know, earnings incentive mechanisms that, that would put demand flexibility on a 
level playing field with other resources from a financial standpoint. And then finally, incorporating demand flexibility into utility resource planning is key here. Um, and basically, you know, one of the action recommended actions in this area is just making sure that, that the demand side is thought about holistically and, and comprehensively in utility resource planning, both from the standpoint of making sure that all options are being considered and also that all potential value streams that those options provide are being included in the analysis. Back to you, Andy. Great, thanks, Ryan. So the third pillar focuses on facilitating GEB adoption and use by developing a deeper understanding of consumer motivations to invest in these technologies. This also includes developing tools that co-optimize energy, non-energy, and financial benefits, and shifting workforce training to include smart technologies so building technologies can be installed, operated, and maintained for optimal performance. The first recommendation under this pillar is to understand how users interact with GEBS and the role of technology in order to ensure that users find value in and optimally engage with these technologies with advanced control capabilities. So one key action might be to evaluate the relationship between prices, incentives, technology, and load flexibility and answer open questions about how much an increase in incentive drives an increase in demand flexibility, as well as how different types of incentives affect the consistency or reliability of response. The second recommendation is to develop tools to support decision-making on the design and operation of GEBS. Implementing this recommendation can ensure that utilities, design engineers, implementers, installers, uh, aggregators and building owners can assess and select optimal portfolios of GEB technology strategies. One key action we've identified is to enhance capabilities of existing building performance tools to include demand flexibility and GHG information. So for example, to assess the feasibility and potential benefits of adding demand flexibility strategies with the building commissioning process. And finally, the third recommendation in this pillar is to leverage existing building related workforce programs to integrate advanced building technology and operations, education and training. A skilled, experienced and importantly diverse workforce is needed to support widespread GEB adoption. One key action here is to establish building training and assessment centers that could possibly partner with local colleges and universities for wider reach. Ryan? Great. So the, the fourth and final pillar focuses on how, you know, GEB deployment can be supported through state and federal enabling programs and policies. So there are four recommendations here. The first is leading by example. You know, government buildings, for example, can participate in demand response and energy efficiency programs and markets and make it clear that these programs work and these programs can benefit consumers and the power system. Second recommendation um, includes expanding funding and financing options for GEP technologies. And here, the, you know, the theme is there's already a lot of existing, there are a lot of existing financing and funding mechanisms that exist for energy efficiency. And, and so we have an action related to modifying those to also include demand flexibility. In other words, broadening that definition so that those, those funding mechanisms extend to demand flexibility options as well. Third recommendation is focused on expanding codes and standards for buildings and appliances to incorporate demand flexibility. And there's a similar theme here where, where a lot of the, the recommended actions are focused on kind of leveraging progress we've made on the energy efficiency side to also include more flexibility. So, you know, combining grid interactive requirements and open standards for automated communication with energy efficiency requirements. And then lastly, you know, considering implementing demand flexibility in state targets or mandates. We've seen this happening uh, in a few states already, um, but you know, basically through legislation or, or regulation, statewide or utility specific demand flexibility procurement requirements or, or even just targets can be developed and, and we have definitely seen that driving, even, even historically driving growth in, in the demand flexibility space. So those are the pillars. You know, the last slide is just a summary of, of that kind of concludes the roadmap. I think we won't spend too much time on this so that we do have a few minutes for questions. You know, I think the key takeaway here really is we have intended for the audience of this roadmap to be broad. Um, 
and you know we think and we hope that uh, all stakeholders can can play a really important role in implementing the roadmap recommendations and achieving that goal that that DOE goal that David mentioned in his comments of tripling energy efficiency and demand flexibility in, in residential and commercial buildings by 2030. Um, so with that, uh, with that comment on the important role that all stakeholders can play, Andy, I'll turn it back to you to open this up to a couple questions. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of great questions that came in. Um, really appreciate the interest there. One thing I'll say is there was, um, there's been a fair number of questions about details behind um, the study and the opportunity. And so I'd encourage you to look at the GEB roadmap. We do have a pretty extensive set of technical appendices that, that describe a lot of the methodology there. There, there were, there's several questions actually, um, David, I might actually pose this one to you right off the bat. Just a lot of folks excited about some of the opportunities that are here in the roadmap. So I just wanted to ask if there, if you could speak to any opportunities to partner with DOE uh, to achieve this goal around uh, tripling energy efficiency and demand flexibility. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And whoever asked that, uh, again, please, please stay in touch with us. So, that, but there are a lot of different levels there, and it didn't. I didn't read all the uh, comments in the Q and A uh, on that. But look, there are a lot of different ways to do that. Some of you may be engaged in research and development. That's one set of activities at DOE. Others are going to be involved. Of you are involved in metrics and benchmarking. And, and uh, uh, that's a different set of activities and others with a demonstration uh, and others with, as you heard from some of those recommendation codes and or standards and or other tools. So the, the, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is it, the exact place depends. I, I'll give one separate uh, comment. I, I suspect many of you uh, put applications in for our Connected Communities Competitive Grant uh, proposal that was on, went on the street a few months ago. We we're looking at those now, and we we got, we got swamped with really a, a good number and high quality proposals. And we're going through that uh, tomorrow. The president will release his budget request, and if the uh, budgeting gods are are kind on us, then uh, you know I hope we'll be able to do more of those kinds of demonstrations uh, in the future. Another another round of them. But so. Uh, so the answer is yes, and please be in touch. Great, uh, thanks, David. Um, Ryan, there were several questions about the study, um, but I, I was just sort of curious if you could talk a little bit about how some of the future emerging technologies, integration of DERs, you know, emerging rate designs, other developments like that, how might those change the GEB opportunity numbers uh, that, that you calculated? Can you give a sense of that? Sure, I think there are, I think there are two ways that you know emerging opportunities could increase the, the benefits that we've quantified in this study. You know, the, the first is on, on that adoption side. And I think I mentioned that our assumptions around consumer adoption of the technologies and participation in energy efficiency and demand flexibility programs um, is a big driver of the results. So I think, again, the, the more that can be done to incentivize adoption of the technologies through new rate designs, uh, through new utility programs or aggregator programs that provide customers with the incentive to go out and adopt those technologies, the more we can do to push uh, the, the achieved benefits of these programs toward that upper end of the range. Now, in, in terms of taking the benefits beyond that range, that's where some of those other emerging technologies that you mentioned, Andy, come into play. And what we didn't end up quantifying, we discussed in this roadmap, but didn't quantify is the broader opportunity associated with integrating battery storage and electric vehicles and, and rooftop solar into buildings in a way that provides additional flexibility and efficiency. So I think again, you know, a next step in, in the research that I that I think is, is guaranteed to significantly increase those benefits numbers that we've quantified is oriented around the role that those technologies can play in, in boosting all of these benefits. Thanks, Ryan. And then Marianne, you know, you have decades of experience in, in building controls. I was, I was, there was a couple of questions that kind of came in around, you know, what are some examples of multi-building control? And also, you know, what are some examples of control technologies that don't require, you know, a PhD in, in quantum physics um, uh, to, to implement or understand? 
Yeah, thanks, Andy. Super quick, I know we're reaching the end of the time. Uh, we today have things like smart thermostats. And if you have a smart thermostat and a heat pump water heater that is gonna be controlled, you wanna be able to control those things together. So we're moving towards a time where we care about that local control of an individual device, but if we can have a whole building control, we can go a lot further in sculpting that electric load. And there's been questions about demand flexibility versus demand response. This, so this is not you know, five to 10 events each summer. It may be all year round that we want that building to be, to be able to interact with the grid. We may want to take more of that electric load uh, when it's really clean, when there's a lot of renewables. So we want to take load and move load to other times of the day. And that multi-building controller, really community scale systems, uh, uh, a city block, a, a, a group of um, buildings, maybe corporate buildings, a, a big hospital, a school district, uh, a lot of aggregation technologies. So aggregators have an important role to play in helping us to create grid interactive efficient buildings. That's great. Thanks, Marianne. I think that's a great uh, answer to end on. Um, so I, I wanna thank everybody for, for your participation. Um, excellent questions and great discussion today. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, you know, we'll be posting this recording and a copy of the slides. Um, you'll, you can access the report immediately if you go to Geb Roadmap. That's one uh, set of words together, gebroadmap.lbl.gov. And um, again, we, we appreciate your participation and invite you to continue to partner with DOE, um, LBNL, and others to achieve this um, very important goal. So thank you very much.